During German colonial rule in the 1800s, communities indigenous to Namibia were displaced from millions of hectares of their ancestral land. In 1962, about 30 million hectares of this land was returned to indigenous Namibians under the South African Oudendal Plan. Indigenous people were resettled in Bantustan homelands and their ancestries were completely disregarded and overlooked during the resettlement. Since independence, the Namibian government has resettled 5,000 beneficiaries on 5 million hectares of land. The Landless People's Movement claimed that they are representing all the fringe communities who have been sidelined by government in the land resettlement process, all the communities who were left out from the start. Spearheaded by former Deputy Minister of Land Reform Bernardo Swartboy, the Landless People's Movement have been mobilizing communities in the north and in the south. As the entire country fervently awaits the upcoming land conference, tension rises between government and the Landless People's Movement. With us in the studio is Bernardo Swartboy, former Deputy Minister of Land Reform, Swapo member and leader to the Landless People's Movement. Good evening viewers and welcome to an exclusive. My name is Joseph Shifani and I am your host. Tonight, we discuss the ancestral land issue and now a newly launched movement made up of land activists and leaders from all corners of the country have taken center stage in uniting communities that want their land returned back to them. Bernardus, let me thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me, Joseph. In the past, you've insisted that land reform in the country has failed primarily due to the fact that the uh, target set by government fell short uh, of the amount of land that was taken by previous governments. Was that the only weakness or is it still the weakness? And also, what could have been done differently? You are right that it is part of the, the weaknesses in terms of the target of land that has to be acquired to satisfy the, the number of hectares of land that was lost uh, through two colonial interventions, first by the Germans and then by the South African apartheid regime. So that is one aspect of the insufficiency of the land reform process. The second aspect of it is uh, who the target recipients are. Uh, Generally, generally, the target recipients are everyone that has lost land as well as those that have not lost land and are still on their lands. Uh, thirdly, uh, it has failed as, as an initiative to build a strong agricultural economy and to enhance our capacity for food self-sufficiency, uh, food self-sufficiency by virtue of the structure of the affirmative action loan scheme, which has not been very uh, well articulated to benefit those that have previously not been able to access land on an agricultural commercial basis. Then lastly, uh, it has failed because the government has not been able to sufficiently realize that even in instances when you resettle uh, uh, individuals where you would argue that you are given land for free, a sufficient financial capacity has often lacked uh, that would assist beneficiaries to build and expand uh, the farm both in terms of livestock and of um, uh, horticulture. And that type of funding uh, on a sustained basis in a way that is able to liberate a person from poverty toward a better living standard has also not been forthcoming genuinely. And at the end of it all, it is quite fair for, for any person to conclude that our government has not fully understood what to do with land, what land reform means, how to capacitate people for genuine economic and social development through land reform. And they have also not connected land reform with agrarian reform. And when you split these two uh, aspects of land reform and agrarian reform, you are bound to experience a steep slope downward in which you allocate land, but you do not support uh, the reform of agriculture 
on that piece of land and subsequently in the entire country. And those countries that have been successful in terms of their land reform have a highly intertwined land reform with agrarian reform. In Zimbabwe, they have done this very well. And at some stage after independence, the Zimbabwean agricultural sector, in fact, is stated to have grown by 6,000% because the government understood that land reform and agrarian reform are two sides of the same coin. Um, and unfortunately, we have not been able to reach that level of deeper understanding uh, of, of land and the agrarian question. Um, you praise the uh, Zimbabwean system. However, when the landless movement, the time when it was formed, uh, many actually um, uh, um, raised concern that uh, it might be, um, uh, it might want uh, Namibia to also move in, the, in that direction. No, I, I praise the Zimbabwean uh, land and agrarian reform immediately after independence of Zimbabwe. Um, I am not making any reference to what eventually happened uh, in in the mid 90s to, to to the 2000s. That is not where I am. I am acknowledging the good work that they have done uh, under the leadership of President Mugabe immediately after independence and how they were able to generally make a contribution to the overall expansion of the GDP of Zimbabwe by appropriately resourcing the agricultural sector. Uh, and we have some lessons to learn from, from Zimbabwe in that regard. And that's all I'm saying. Now let's talk about, about the uh, landless movement itself. Um, who does it consist of and whom does it represent? The Landless People's Movement is a formation that consists of those Namibians that are landless, those Namibians that are land dispossessed, those Namibians who experience no, modern day land no, dispossession. Now no, 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 when you say let me, no, no, when you say landless as in all over the country or Well, there are various reasons why people are landless. Um, in respect of the landless people's movement, our prime focus is to depart from the position of land dispossession as a historic intervention that created subsequent land, uh, land loss and landlessness as we experience it today. That is one element of it. But we are, of course, a, a movement comprised by individuals that have this country as a whole at heart and who identify out of our own uh, experiences, what landlessness means. And therefore, when in Zambezi or in Kavango or in Oshana or Shikoto, a young person is deprived of the land of their parents because that land is taken by force by uh, the powerful and the rich making that young person and that family landless, who then have to flee to Vinduk to avoid um, malnourishment and to avoid a, a social decay and a personal decay of, of his or her life. We, we, we fully understand and find ourselves in solidarity with such individuals and in such instances, we have pledged our solidarity to those individuals that experience that type of, of, of landlessness. Mm. Now, um, it was launched um, quite recently. Tell us a bit about the progress that <coughs> it has uh, made uh, thus far. The Landless People's Movement is merely five months old. Um, in its short time, it has achieved quite a lot of important milestones. First, at the level of sensitizing those that are land dispossessed, uh, as well as those that have lost land out of the new type of elitist uh, uh, robbery of, of the weak and the, and the poor, we can claim without fear of any contradiction that the mobilization and the sensitization of those individuals, 
as well as the rest of the Namibian public, has been very good. A year ago, you would not find people talking about land dispossession from the position of uh, uh, colonialism. You would find both politicians and commentators uh, and members of public talking about land dispossession from the point of view, or, or landlessness from the point of view uh, that all Namibians lost land, that all Namibians need land, uh, without making a historic analysis of how certain population groups lost land, and without making a thorough interrogation so that policy of government is able to direct itself toward addressing landlessness as a result of colonial land dispossession. So in that regard, we have done very well. We have done very well as Landless People's Movement, uh, quite exceptionally, I must say, to generate a particular sense of consensus among those in the political fray uh, around the important issue of land dispossession that must be addressed as a, as a central question of land reform in certain communities. And that land reform and therefore resettlement cannot be generalized in all communities. And that you need specific interventions in respect of, of land reform from various communities. We have also been able to have the land bill which was really being pushed through parliament or an attempt was made to push it through parliament very illegally uh, for that bill to be postponed uh, pending the land conference so that that bill is given the necessary weight and enjoys the common consensus of those Namibians with an interest in, in the land question. We have also been able, Joseph, to, as a matter of fact, rally uh, Namibia around the question of ancestral land. It is a discussion that people say should not be held, that ancestral land is a no-go area, that the call to return ancestral land is not practical. And we have reminded people that in terms of social justice, in terms of the principles of restorative justice, in terms of the principles of economic inequality, in terms of the principles of poverty eradication, ancestral land and its return forms a central connection for many members of the, of the Namibian House uh, to which they uh, can and should be entitled in order to make their full and firm contribution toward national economic development. Mind you, I am very impressed that as a result, amongst others, of our work that those communities that were considered weak, small in number, and probably not very influential, are able now to stand up to government in their demand for ancestral land. The Ministry of uh, Land Reform uh, was supposed to have wanted to table the land bill in the National Assembly. Um, as the head of that ministry, um, maintained that they had in fact um, consulted uh, all stakeholders and groups um, involved. Uh, now you, you, you are saying that they haven't. Well, that is the claim. First, those consultations were done many years back. That is one. They were done in the 2006, 2007s, and so on. And so time has really gone in terms of the issues that were raised there. Some issues remained valid, others not. That is one. Secondly, there is an increasing environment 
in which government ministries become so arrogant that they go and consult communities, but within the framework of what they want to consult the communities only. So they sit here in Vinduk and draft certain things, put them on paper, and go and consult communities only in respect of those issues. What then therefore happens is genuine consultations do not occur because they narrow communities only to the issues that ministerial officials, the bureaucrats, want communities to, to comment on. That is not consultation. When you go to a community to consult on land, you go and consult community genuinely to find out in the totality of that question of land, what the communities want. You can't draft a perimeter here in Vintuk and frame the consultation process in accordance with the objectives of what bureaucrats want to achieve in, 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 in terms of the narrow issues that bureaucrats want to achieve and therefore make the consultation process an administrative validation process. That is what is happening. So you go out and meet people you hear their views in respect of documents that you have drafted, but you don't hear the broader views of communities. And that is precisely what happened with this, with this bill. They concluded that they have consulted, but there was stark contradiction and contrast. In fact, very, very profound objections from the very communities that they have claimed to have consulted on that bill in respect of various issues that communities raised or wanted to raise, which they were never allowed to raise, and therefore that bill became problematic. But there is another issue, how government functions illegally against the provisions of its own laws. In terms of the Council of Traditional Authorities Act, any legislation that is drafted that has an impact on communal land must first be tabled at the Council of Traditional Leaders. They must scrutinize it. They must agree that its contents are fine. If they don't agree, they will refer it back to the minister to open the process of consultation and have it retabled again. Once the Council of Traditional Leaders agrees that the substance of a bill that affects communal land, that that's contents are appropriate and that the bill can now be taken to parliament, only then with the approval of the Council of Traditional Leaders can a minister of lands go and table a bill that affects communal land reform. This has not been done. So there was a gross illegality in the prosecution of that land bill. And we highlighted these issues to say, you are playing with fire here, you exclude by constitution and legal provision, the body which is called the Council of Traditional Leaders, which is the principal advisor to the head of state on communal land, you exclude that body from having its input and you run to parliament illegally. You see, since independence and since the land conference, some of the elite began to think that they have this country fully under their control and that because they have positions of responsibility and authority, their views, their perceptions, and their expressions of policy interventions are the only correct and viable and organic views that can and should exist in the prosecution of the development of the people of this country and they began to become extraordinarily arrogant and found ways to close the doors toward meaningful consultation, as has been the case with this bill. When Landless People's Movement came up, I think we were able to liberate the country, at least those that were landless Moses, from the yoke of fear and of the yoke of the oppression of the elite upon land dispossessed people.
by stating categorically that land dispossession must be a central piece together with agrarian reform of land reform and that resettlement therefore is not a sufficient enterprise to which you want to resolve the land question. Suddenly, land dispossessed people us are placed on an equal footing with those that still have their own ancestral land. And suddenly, in order to shut up people from expressing their historic experiences, tribalism, disturbing peace and stability, were used as the public uh, intimidation process from a political point of view, to shun and silence the voices of the land dispossessed people. I mean, until today, Mr. Kengop and his group have not given us, Landless People's Movement, an audience after we have written numerous letters to them. They have not been able to give us <laughs> an audience. And they run around, they run around talking whatever they are talking, but worst of all, without speaking to those that are affected that would be the ones that would help resolve the question of land reform in this country, as it relates in particular to ancestral land and agrarian land reform. They go to countries like Zimbabwe and cause holistic confusion in terms of where they want to go with the policy. Why would you go to Zimbabwe? Seek what knowledge from Zimbabwe? While the people that want land are here at home and you have not been able to speak to them because of your own wishes, you go to a foreign country, as African as that, that country is, and go and make statements and come back and retract and contradict some of those statements. <laughs> Why would you not talk to your children at home and you go and look for the advice of another next door neighbor, while you have never really sat down. Unless, if you have not sat down, as we are saying with, with the Landless People's Movement, unless you feel that there's no reason to sit down with them, unless you feel and you are convinced that the issue of ancestral land for which they are standing up as Landless People's Movement is an issue that your government will never ever entertain. And if that is the case, if it is the attitude by Mr. Kenkop and his group that they will never ever entertain the question of ancestral land, we have the capacity to take them to court. We have the capacity to take them through the AU processes and the United Nations processes. And we have the capacity to inflict electoral harm on those that refuse to sit down with a landless people's movement, but more so who refuse to meet the demand, not a request, and that's one of the things that the court said in the Richterfeld question, not a request to government, a legitimate right to have ancestral land returned. Although if they are not willing to do that, we will inflict electoral harm on those who are shying behind a land conference coming, therefore we will not have any opinion. We will inflict political harm through an electoral process on those come 2019. And we have started mobilizing that. Are those the steps that the LPM will take? Uh, Definitely. If, 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 uh, if uh, you do not, uh, the movement doesn't get um, or isn't satisfied with the outcome of the conference? It is not a request we are making to the government. It is a right that never extinguished, which we are claiming to be returned, which is the right to our ancestral land to use and possess and hold it in title. Now, if they don't agree to that, we have that political capacity. And if it is a weapon that is available to us as it is in this instance, we will deploy it to the fullest measure and tell our people, those political parties that have not supported us, those political parties that have shunned 
our demand through their government of ancestral land return, those political parties don't go and vote for them. In the very last question, what role does tribalism play uh, in the land debate? Because uh, we saw that um, your arguments uh, were often labeled as efforts to incite uh, tribalism. Well, the land allocation has been tribal. Go look at the resettlement farms. Why has the ministry not re released the list? Why haven't they? So maybe you must go as a journalist and interrogate how tribalism... We did try. And they refused. So it must ring a bell. If you don't want to disclose, there is something to hide. And they were trying to shift blame from them and their tribalism to me and to the Landless People's Movement. It flopped and it will continue to flop because we are in solidarity with the rest of Namibia and the rest of Namibia is in solidarity with the Landless People's Movement. Thank you very much for this good interview. Bernardus, let me thank you again. For thank the time. you very much, Joseph. It's always a pleasure talking to you. There is all we have for you tonight. You can share your views with us by texting them to 555. Until next time, I'm Joseph Shifani signing off for one exclusive.